Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Ooh. <laughs> I almost had some songs behind me. Good morning, good morning, and welcome to First Alliance. Um, I don't know about you, but June kind of snuck up on me. And it's already like several days into June. So for a lot of us, that means that our routines change a little bit, or at least, at the very least, for some of us, that might mean that we have visitors coming to visit, or we're going somewhere else. But today, I just wanted to welcome you to church and to remind you that as you go or as you do some of those new schedules for summer, don't forget to bring the good news with you. And that's part of the reason why we do these ping pong balls, is just to remind ourselves that in the busyness of life, to remember what our mission is. And bringing the gospel to others is the mission that God gave us. And, and truly having those gospel conversations with someone, keeping your eyes open, your heart open for those opportunities. And it can seem very um, intimidating, but it can be as simple as just telling someone, this is what I was like before I met Jesus, and this is what I was like after. And that's the gospel right there. And I just wanted to remind you to do that. And then if you have that conversation with someone and they end up coming to faith, would you write their name on one of our uh, white ping pong balls and drop it in that wall back there so we can celebrate with you and pray for that person as they begin their walk with Jesus. <clears throat> if you are inviting people to church and they come, maybe you're inviting them to our online platform and they, they log in, write their name on a blue ping pong ball because that's just one other way that we can bring the gospel to people is by saying, come and see. Just come and see what we're doing at our church. Come and give it a listen. Come and worship with us. And we want to celebrate with you if one of your friends accepts that invitation and joins you. Maybe you're one of those people today. Maybe you're visiting for the first time or it's been a while since you've been here and you're trying to connect or reconnect. We have a simple way to at least start that process for you. And that's just through a simple text. They'll put the information on the screen behind me. You just text that phrase to that number and it'll just start a, a simple conversation so we can tell you a little bit more about our faith family and get to know a little bit more about you. I wanna remind you that since it is the first Sunday of the month, we are celebrating the Lord's Supper together. If you did not grab one of the little communion cups on your way in, you can raise your hand and someone will run it up to you or you can scooch out during one of the songs. If you're worshiping with us at home and visiting with us on our online campus, I want to give you an opportunity, too, to collect some materials around your home so that you can participate with us as we remember the Lord's death and resurrection together. But let's begin today by worshiping together. Would you guys stand and join me?
You guys can have a seat for just a moment. Hey, if I haven't met you yet, or you don't know me, you're trying to figure out who was that one again. I'm Tracy. <laughs> I direct the kids' ministries here at First Alliance, and I love what I do. I love what I do, and I love who I get to do it with. I love my team that I work with here on Sundays, and the staff that I get to work with during the week. The staff, we do a lot of different things together, and one of the things we do is some ministry training or leadership development. And this year, we've been going through a book on leadership actually together and then getting together every once in a while to discuss the concepts in it. And this past section that we just went over, there was a chapter on equipping. And the author was specifically, of course, encouraging us and saying, how do you equip your team to serve? But he was coming from the place of Ephesians where Paul said, Christ has given us the apostles and evangelists, pastors, teachers, in order to equip his people for service. And then he went on to say, this author, that that Greek word for equip has different nuances, but one of them comes with this idea of returning something back to its original condition. And honestly, I couldn't like jive those two ideas together, like equipping, training, and returning something back to its original condition until Friday. This past Friday, Jamie Bruno and I, we were at a local hospital and we were visiting one of our very long-term team members, Diane, maybe you know her. She, when I joined this staff at a very part-time position almost 10 years ago, she was already serving and continued to until this day. Before that, I think she worked in student ministries. She's ushered, she fills chair pockets, she slips me money when we're doing fundraisers. Diane just serves, and over the last six to nine months, she's just had some health issues, and as you can imagine, if she's in the hospital, she's facing a fairly serious one right now. And so we were talking and praying together, and one of the things I was saying is, Diane, I know when, when it's someone like you who loves to help others, it's so hard to be in the position where not only can you not do that, but now you have to let others help you and serve you, and that's so difficult. And as I was talking with her about that, everything just finally came together and clicked. Because I have to be, I'm totally honest, I don't know that Diane knows how not to serve. That is how she lives her faith. That's how she lives it out. And if you go to read on in Ephesians, Paul says that he equips us to serve so that we can be mature and serving. Bringing up the body of Christ to become more like Christ. That bringing us back to the position, to the condition that God created us in. Because as we just saying, God is a generous God. Grace upon grace upon grace. He gives and gives and gives. When he walked this earth, he served and served and served. And that is how he created us. We're created in his image. So we, that is our natural condition, to serve others, to give generously out of our time, our talents, our resources. That is how he made us to be. And that's the character I see in Diane and in many of you as you serve. And at this time in our service where we typically stop for a moment and remind ourselves, why do we do what we do? Why do we give? Why do we serve? It's to build his kingdom. It's out of obedience. But it's also returning us back 
training us ourselves up to that original condition that he created us to be. People who give, people who serve. If you're one of those people that give regularly of your time, your talents, your resources, I just want to say thank you because you help his kingdom advance, not just here but all across the world. If you don't yet do that and you don't know how, man, grab any staff member and we will help you see how living that life of service brings you again, as Ephesians says, into full maturity in Christ. And we would love to walk alongside with you as you do that. Um, behind me on the screen, they'll put some of the ways that we do give here at First Alliance. We don't pass the plate. We do most of it online or texting, or you can use the envelopes in the seats in front of you. There's little wooden boxes in that back hallway in the corners where you can slip it in. But thank you. And just remember that. Remember that when we do those things, we're returning our hearts, training our hearts, equipping our hearts to go back to that original condition that God created us in, to serve and to give and to work in his kingdom. Hey, if you're online joining us, it's e even easier for you. You just click. <laughs> even easier. But I just thank you again. And I invite you, would you just bow your heads with me for a moment? And we're just going to pray over these offerings. God, I just thank you so much for the many people that I could name by name, Lord, or at least by face, who continue to live a life of service, God, because that's what you created us for. Whether it's giving of their time, Lord, or, or helping with the talent they have, Jesus, or giving of the resources that you have blessed them with so that others can be blessed. I thank you for them. I pray that you will bless the givers here today, God. I pray that you would help to equip us through other people, Lord, to continue to become more and more like you, more and more back to that original condition that you created us in. And I praise you for all that you do, not only here in this local church body, but throughout the world as you build your kingdom. And I pray this all in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, guys. Would you just stand for a moment? We're going to sing one more song together.
for your great love, that you set us free and you extend us grace every single day, even though we don't deserve it. God, thank you that loved by you is part of our identity as your children. Those words describe who we are, loved by you. God, thank you for all that you've done. And God, I pray that since you extended us grace, that we will extend grace to others. Because you loved us, we will love others. Help us to be more like you, because that's who we're meant to be. We were created to be like you and to glorify you in all that we do. So I pray that we will do that and that you will equip us and help us to do that. Thank you, God, for all that you've done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, it's good to be with you as you all take a seat. Uh, my name is Dwayne. If we haven't met, uh, I'm the student pastor here, and I see a lot of my students in here right now. Uh, the, uh, so our uh, crash landing, our student area is uh, being remodeled a little bit, and so that room is closed, and so those students are here in this room, and parents, uh, I had somebody say something, hey, did you do that on purpose because of today's message? And uh, I would just say no. I would just say that uh, that's God's providence. We happen to be on the fifth commandment, and the kids are here, and that's great. But uh, so if you have your Bibles with you, I would invite you to turn to Exodus chapter 20. That's where we're going to be. That's where we've been for a while as we continue our series on the Ten, on the Ten Commandments. And uh, it's been really cool to have Pastor Nate with us and sharing on the first four so far our... Uh, our, our first four commandments have been these, uh, these commandments that are focused on God. The idea that we do not have any other gods before the one true God. That we don't make for ourselves graven images. We don't have idols and things that we put before him. We don't use his name in vain. And it's more than just typing out OMG in a text message. It's, it's this, this idea that his name is holy. And it's not something to be used flippantly. And it's definitely not something that we use for our own purposes and agenda. And then last week, uh, Nate talked to us about the Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath. And uh, judging from social media that I saw later that day and on Monday, what a lot of us took away is that we went home and took a nap after. <laughs> that was our excuse to get away with a, with a Sunday afternoon nap. And, of course, I don't think you ever need an excuse for that. But... Um, I think that's, that was our big takeaway for a lot of us. But we should remember the Sabbath. It's a holy day to the Lord. And so as we kind of look at these, uh, the, the 10 kind of as, as a whole, we're reminded that these are words from an, from an ancient text, right? They were written a really long time ago. And they were given to an ancient people from an ancient civilization. And it's like, how are these relevant to us today in 2022 in this air-conditioned building sitting in our cushy seats? And it's my hope and prayer that over the last several weeks you've begun to see, if you've been with us, and hopefully you'll see today since you're here with us, that these are still relevant, that, that they are um, impacting on us today, even in our culture, even in 2022. Uh, and as I was preparing for this, I saw something that kind of helped me relate to the 10 as a whole. Uh, I was kind of reminded about something from, from my past. And if some of you know that I did not begin my adult uh, life as a student pastor, I was actually a school teacher for a lot of years. And when I was in college, preparing for that, I became a substitute teacher. Now, I did this mostly for the, the notoriety and the high pay. That's, that was, uh, that's why I took on the substitute teacher role. But I will, I'll have to say something to you um, at the risk of sounding prideful. I, I hope I don't. I was a really good substitute teacher. Like it, was, it was something that, that I excelled at, okay? And um, I was able to kind of go into classrooms where maybe students weren't all that well behaved and, and I, could, I could just, I could get them to listen. I could get them to do things they wouldn't normally do. In fact, there would be some times when I would like, I'd stop in the office to get my keys or whatever and the people in the office would be like, good luck with that one. Um, 
you know, like, or I would get warnings. They're like, it's that classroom. It's just a bunch of ankle biters and curtain climbers, and they eat Lucky Charms and Mountain Dew for breakfast and substitute teachers for lunch, and you're never going to make it out of that classroom alive. And, and I, I would somehow, usually, always, usually, be able to go in and kind of bring a little bit of semblance of order and, and, and get through the day. Now, um, here was my secret. See, this is what the office didn't know. Um, and I'm going to tell you. So if any of you aspire to be a substitute teacher, it's, it's a noble calling. Um, I had a secret formula. You want to know what it is? Bribery. Um, I, I, I literally bribed the students um, to behave. So I, I had this I had this shoe box that I had wrapped up in fancy paper. It was called my mystery box. And I would like get dollar store prizes or whatever, and I would put some in there. And at the end of every day, if students behaved, then they would get a chance to win whatever was in the box. And um, I don't know if you've ever worked with elementary school students, but very much like adults, they'll do a lot to win a prize. <laughs> and so, uh, listen, y'all, it, it worked. It worked, okay? Um, and uh, so, there were some benefits to this, right? One, it, it kept me in business, right? It kept me working. Schools would call me back and teachers were appreciative, but there were some benefits to the students as well. Because whatever it is that we were doing that, that day, if, if they were behaving and following the rules that, and, and guys, I didn't give them new rules. We worked within the existing rules, the, exi- the existing guidelines. Um, we would go over those and, and if they followed them, then they were in a better position to learn which was, after all, their purpose for being there, right? We're, we're at school to, to learn something. And so they put them in a position where they were better, better able to fulfill their purpose for being there. Um, there was also some pride that came from the students there. Like, they were working together, and they, were, they would do well. And especially in those classes that kind of had a bad reputation, they, they, they kind of liked being, you know, getting the compliments from other teachers. Or, you know, there were the, you know, those classrooms that normally kind of, like, like just ran around in the halls, you know, and they're walking in kind of military formation and, and the other teachers, instead of giving them dirty looks and side eyes, are going, hey, nice job, guys. And they liked that. that was, it was something that was a positive for them. But here's the, here's the thing about all of that bribery is that um, it was temporary. Uh, I was only there for a day usually, and when I left, my bribes left with me, and Good, whether good or bad, when their teacher came back, things went back to however it was before, right? And, um, and so that was fine. I was doing great with that whole substitute thing. But then one day I was asked if I could do a more long-term subbing position. There was a teacher that had gone on maternity leave. And um, I quickly discovered that in a long-term situation, bribery doesn't cut it, Okay. Um, I know I have some teachers in this room, and you, so you, you'll, you'll know what I'm talking about. But, but one thing, I couldn't afford it, okay? Um, you, you just, you can't, you know, you can't keep that going. And then also, it gets old. And so, but you can see as a young man, I, I took my education with my students very seriously. Um, this is actually that class of that, and I actually, I know most of these students by name, and some of us are friends on Facebook, and it was a really cool experience. But here's the thing. Bribery did not work forever with these guys. What I discovered was <clears throat> that after a while, if I wanted them to listen, if, if I wanted there to be any long-term change, it had to come through relationship. So they had to trust me, and they had to know that, that I trusted them and that I believed in them. And so what would happen is um, I would start to notice things. You know, hey, I like your haircut. We got some new shoes. Uh, build up a little bit of trust with them. Every now and then I'd show up at a baseball game or a dance recital or, uh, or another, a birthday party or something like that. And as I began to do that, here's what I noticed. Their desire to follow the rules or their following the rules was less about an exercise of the hands, feet, and the mouth than it became an exercise of the heart and the mind. And so what happens, I realized that if I could reach them on the inside, that, that outward behavior would follow. So I had to move from this extrinsic motivation of the bribe to the intrinsic motivation of, oh, he like actually cares about me. 
He, he, he sees me. He knows my name, right? He, he knows when I get a haircut. Wow, this is interesting. And so here's what's cool about this, and I hope that you see that this is what Jesus does for us. See, he works on the inside. He does a work on us on the inside that manifests itself in us outward to the outside. And so um, I hope, as I said, that you hear this, because here's the thing. Um, a lot of times we hear things and we see things, but we don't really hear them and see them. And it kind of it reminds me of this time. I drove on the most beautiful road I've ever driven on in my life. It was called the, the Blue Ridge Viaduct. I don't know, anybody, anybody here ever been to the Blue Ridge Viaduct? Gorgeous, gorgeous stretch of road. And I remember driving on this road for the first time, and when, when I hit this stretch, I was awestruck. The foliage was amazing. Even though it was summertime when I was there, the foliage was amazing. And I just remember seeing the architecture, like the way this thing just contoured the mountain and like the juxtaposition of just this man-made architecture on this gorgeous natural landscape and the vistas. And I'm just like, my jaw is on the floor because I'm like this, I'm this Florida boy who grew up, I was born and raised in Florida and I'm just seeing this and it's amazing. And I looked around at the nine-year-olds that were in the van with me. So I was a summer camp counselor. Okay, we were going on a field trip. And y'all, they could have been in the Walmart parking lot for all it. It, it wouldn't have mattered if they were on the, the 41 access road in front of the plumbing supply store. It wouldn't, they didn't even see this. And I was like, what is wrong with them? And then I realized they live in Blowing Rock, North Carolina. They're used to this. Like they've been on this road before. And even if they haven't, they, they've seen They've grown up surrounded by this. And I feel like sometimes that happens to us in the church. We, when, when we're in the church so much, we're used to hearing and seeing, and things become commonplace. And, and I don't want that to happen to us today. So I'm going to ask you this. If you hear nothing else I say today, right, if you're playing Wordle on your phone right now, stop. I want you to look up and catch this, okay? Catch this right now. Um, In my experience, this is, this is something that people in the church miss the most. God did not give us the law. He didn't give us the law so that we could try to be good enough to work our way up to him. Instead, it's quite the opposite. He worked his way down to us, and he fulfilled the law so that we don't have to. In fact, Matthew writes about this in chapter 5 and verse 17. He's quoting Jesus. He said, Jesus said, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. See, just as in my classroom, I couldn't throw out the rules, right? The rules were still important. They still mattered. I can't abolish them, right? Jesus says, I'm not throwing the law out. They're still important. They're still what's best for you. But I've came to fulfill them. He came to fulfill them. See, when we live according to his ways, it puts us best in the position to fulfill our purpose. Why he put us here in the first place. Our motivator is not to earn something. Rather, it's because of the love and gratitude for the work he's already done in our lives and the work that he's doing through our lives. And so we don't do good so he will love us. We do good because he loves us. And so the rules are good, right? When followed, there are benefits for us, right? Life becomes simpler. I notice I didn't say easy. Life doesn't become easier, okay? But life becomes simple when we have guidelines, when we have boundaries. Um, not long ago, I was, at the, I was at the bedside of an elderly woman who um, was near the end of her life. And she was, she actually called our crisis line and uh, I had to like do this whole thing and figure out where she was and I, I finally found her address and got to her house and, and she was confused a little bit, um, not completely cogent, but she was asking these questions about why life was so hard and why she was in this bed and couldn't get up and, and why these, these bad things had happened to her her whole life. And... Um, as I was talking to her, there was a nurse that was in the room kind of taking care of things, and she was quiet the whole time. She didn't say anything. And I remember at one point just asking this lady, I said, well, man, what, 
what do you think your life would have been like? How, how do you think it might have been different if everybody in your life, you, your, your parents, your, your friends, your, your, the rest of your family, your siblings, and the, the people that you, that you worked with, what do you think it would have been like if those folks would have followed the Ten Commandments? And, and she was thinking, and the nurse, who had been quiet up until now, just let out this audible gasp. And she was like, oh, man, that would be amazing. Think about it. What would it, what would it be like? And I began to help this lady see that a lot of the things that happened in her life that, that were negative were, came at the hands of folks not following the boundaries that God set, set for us and came at the hands of her own failures to, to follow the commands that God set before us because life becomes a lot more complex when we don't live within those boundaries, right? So <clears throat> as, we, uh, as we look today at, at the next command, so far we've, we'll, we'll notice that the commands up until this point have been focused on God, right? These are something, some of us call these the vertical commands be, be, because they're between us and God, right? No gods before me, no graven images, don't use my name in vain, right? Remember to keep the Sabbath to me, for me. And so, <clears throat> and so these are all vertical commands, but today we begin a list of commands that are more horizontal. They're between us and the people around us, right? And so um, in light of that, I want to point to a passage in Scripture. I, this is one I've, I've always loved, um, where Jesus was asked by the Pharisees about which of these commands is the most important. And uh, a, lot of the, uh, a lot of the religious leaders of the time, you know, they were really, they were out to get Jesus. And uh, one of the Sadducees had just failed in doing that, and that's why he's so sad, you see, because you can't pull one over on Jesus. Um, but right after that, right after that, the Pharisees try to take a crack at it. And we see this in Matthew 22 starting in verse uh, 34, and we see that when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, a lawyer, says he's going to trick Jesus, right? He asked him a question to test him. He said, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? <clears throat> Excuse me, guys. And he said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your mind, this is the first and greatest commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And on these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. And I love this response because here's what Jesus did. He basically said this. Um, he basically said, well, if you love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and, and, and soul, then you're, those are our vertical commands. Right? Those are the things that are between us. And if you, uh, if you love your neighbor as yourself, then you're following all of those horizontal commands. And the, and the second one is just like the first one because, listen, you can't love your neighbor well if you don't love God first. And you're not loving God well if you don't love your neighbor who bears God's image. And so when asked that question, Jesus basically answered with, well, all of them. And so it didn't work too well with the Pharisees, they weren't able to, to trick him. But um, when we love God with all that we have and all that we are, we love our neighbors as ourselves, we're able to follow all of these commands to the fullness, to the fullest. And so let's dig into today's command. Students, this is why we uh, close the building, just for you. Exodus 20, verse 12. Honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land that the Lord is giving you. What does that mean for us? Well, I'm no theologian or Bible scholar, but I think it means honor your parents. It's the, uh, this is the first of those horizontal commandments. And doesn't it make sense that God would give that first relational or horizontal command to us regarding and about the, the people that would be the first relationship we would ever have? Our parents. They're the first people that we will enter into relationship with. They are the people that we will have the longest, most likely the longest relationship with. Now, I know that for some of us, this is an easy amen. Some of us grew up in a, just a wonderful homes, and our, maybe our parents loved Jesus and, and, you know, gave us pizza every night, and we got great Christmas presents and all that. 
But I know that there are some here where this is a little bit of a, ooh, Dwayne, this is tough. This is hard. For you, I would say, hey, hold on a minute and we'll get there, okay? We're, we're gonna get there. But first, let, let's look at this. Let's take it at face value and let's look and ask ourselves, what does the word honor mean? If we're to honor our father and mother. Well, the Hebrew word for honor is kabed. And it consists of the same letter as the Hebrew word for heavy. Right? In other words, to, to honor means treating one's parents with the gravity that their position demands. Right? The thoughts and the opinions of our parents should carry weight with us in our lives. It's not a requirement for blanket submission or blind obedience to their every whim. Right? It's simply a high regard for the position that they hold in our lives. And it's interesting, the opposite of the word honor is kalel. Uh, for some of you thinking it's not, that's, I'm not talking about Superman and his original cri- Krypton name, right? But ka- kalel, uh, the word literally is translated to curse. Well, it's, tra- it's, I'm sorry, it's literally translated to make light of, but it's used as the word to curse. And so when we are not giving our parents the proper weight in our lives, that not, um, not ass- assigning them that kind of weight, and by treating them lightly, we're actually cursing our parents. Um, you might have also noticed that, that unlike any of the other commands, this one comes with a promise, and you might notice that the nature of the promise is positive. Okay, I don't know about you, other parents in this room, but when I give my children a command like this, it often comes with a negative attached to it. For example, boy, you better listen to your mother, right? Or you're grounded until you're 25, right? We, you know, we might say something like, honor thy father and thy mother so that thine Xbox might not be donated to Goodwill. <laughs> you know, uh, something like that. Obey your parents in the Lord that thou mayest not be confined to thy room. Um, <laughs> But God's promise to us, it's different. It's, it's favorable in nature. He says, so, so that you may live long in the land the Lord is giving you. And then, just in case you think that maybe this fell out of favor over the years, Paul was, uh, was there to remind us in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 1. He says, children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first command with a promise, that it may go well with you. And that you may live long in the land. Why is this? So that it may go well with us. Well, it would make sense that, um, that it's going to go well with us when we listen to our parents. Because, uh, and that, to be quite honest, that we may live longer. Um, I know that my three boys have lived to this point with, the, uh, with some of the commands that my wife and I have given them where they may not have otherwise. Okay. <laughs> Uh, you know, we don't put paper clips in the light socket, right? We don't do that. Um, you know, uh, I know that that trash bag looks like it would make a cool parachute, but let's not jump off the roof and find out. Um, you know, where are you going with daddy's blowtorch? Things like that. Um, and then as we get older, sometimes we get some other advice from our parents. You know, hey, open that Roth IRA while you're still young, while you still have a chance. Right, Brent? Absolutely. Brent says amen. Um, Watch out for those credit cards. Wear sunscreen. Like if, if my boys did that, then they wouldn't be sunburned today. They didn't listen to mom and dad. But um, anyway, but here's, here's the thing. With, with very rare exceptions, even parents who don't seem to get it right, they want the best for their kids. For the most part, we can at least say that if, if um, most children will scarcely find somebody who's more invested and their success than their parents. A lot of times I have opportunities to counsel with students. I work mostly with teenagers and uh, sometimes students will come and sit down with me and they will express their frustration with their parents. That's about the nicest way that I can say that. They'll come and they'll wanna complain to me about mom and dad and I'll have to stop them and say, wait a second, I need you to understand something. Um, Man, I care about you, I love you. But I could never love you the way that your mom and dad love you. Can't do it. Um, And the reason that I know that I can't do that is because I could never love those kids the way I love my boys. 
And why is that? Well, they're my boys. They're mine. And I love them deeply, and I want the absolute best for them. I want them to be bigger than me, stronger than me, better than me, smarter than me. I want them to love Jesus more than me. And when I'm gone, I want them to be here carrying on a legacy, right, that I've passed on to them, that they can pass on to their kids, right? I want the very best for my boys. And so there might be a time or two in their lives where they'll get better advice for someone, from someone else, but they will never find somebody more invested in the outcome than they will from their mom and me because they're our boys. So on the whole, I would say, with exceptions, parents do the best that they know how with the tools that they have for their children. And for that, we should honor them, at least honor the position that they hold. We don't regard them lightly and here we are, some of you might be saying, well, that's, that's great for you, Dwayne. You love your boys, right? That's great for you. Um, but what about when a parent is maybe not quite so honorable? How do we deal with it then? Well, here's what I would say then. When it's hard, honor them anyway. Honor them anyway. Well, well why would I do that? I'm glad you asked. Quite simply, it's, it's one of the ten. It's one of the Ten Commandments. You know, it's, it's funny because we don't question some of the other commandments. We don't question do not murder, right? You're like, but Dwayne, that guy is so annoying. <laughs> we don't question that one. But with this one, a lot of us, for a lot of us, our defenses go up right away. And you're like, you know what? You don't know my situation. You don't know what my childhood was like. right? There was abuse. They weren't there for me. They neglected me. They abandoned me me. How do you honor someone who abandoned you? Well, let's start here. We looked at what the word honor means. Let's talk about what the word honor does not mean. It does not mean blind obedience. It doesn't mean that we place ourselves in a position to be abused or neglected. It definitely doesn't mean that. It doesn't even mean that we pretend something to be true about someone that is not true. That would be a lie. Um, Honoring someone should not require you to break any of the other nine commandments. But if we flip that coin over, let's acknowledge this. Someone else's neglect at following God's will for their lives does not mean that we get a pass. Let's not think for a moment that because one or both of our parents failed to follow God's will for their lives, that it makes it okay for us to do the very same thing. Someone else's failure to follow the 10 does not excuse us. What does it mean? It means we forgive. It means we forgive. It means that we can choose to let go of bitterness and and resentment for all the times that our parents let us down. It means rather than than taking the easy road of of listing and dwelling on all of their failures and their parenting mistakes that we can travel the much harder path of trying to find some things that they did right. And when that seems impossible, it means we pray for them. It means we take all the hurt and all the neglect, all the abuse, and we carry it to the feet of Jesus. And we lay it down there. And we ask the Lord to do what we cannot. We ask the Lord to do what only he can. It's because Jesus knew what it was like to be abused. Jesus knew what it was like to come with open arms and loving words only to be beaten and have his words thrown back into his face. See, we don't serve a high priest that cannot sympathize with us. And so, as a start, we can at least honor the position apart from the person And a pretty good litmus test for how we're doing here would be something like this. Would you want your children to honor you the way that you honor your parents? And finally, I would say this. Whether you are a parent now or you're an aspiring parent, um, be a parent worthy of honor. Be a parent that's worthy of honor. I I saw something on a friend's Facebook page. She was doing her homework and reading the Ten Commandments, so I was very 
very pleased to see that. And she had, uh, she couldn't find her, her usual Bible. And so what she found was the Bible that was used somehow alongside of her guest book for her wedding. And she saw that her parents had signed her uh, wedding guest book in sort of a unique, unique way. They, they highlighted this command for her as a subtle reminder, right? But whether you grew up with Warden June Cleaver or if you grew up, some of you are like, who? Um, anyway, that's okay. <laughs> I, I caught it in syndication, okay? I wasn't there for the originals, but um, anyway. Uh, or whether you came from an abusive home or somewhere in between. Um, choose to be a parent that will be easily honored by your children, right? In Ephesians 6, Paul continued his instructions for children and parents. He says, fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Don't provoke your kids. Don't exasperate your children. Don't set them up to fail. Listen, if they've been making some mistakes and doing some things you don't like, don't try to trick them into a, and, and catch them and nail them. Don't try to put them in positions where they're going to fail, especially when they have opportunities to honor you. Set them up for victory. Set them up for success. If your children are young, remember they're young. They're going to do dumb stuff. When they're teenagers, they're going to do really dumb stuff. They are. Remember, remember this. They do not have the benefit of a fully formed and functioning prefrontal cortex the way that most of us in this room <laughs> have. Their ability to think long term has not developed completely yet. Cut them some slack. Give them a break, right? Set them up for success. Um, set boundaries for your kids. Set boundaries. We're reading about the 10. These are about the blessing within the boundaries. We need to set boundaries for our own kids, and sometimes they're not going to like it tough. Stick to your guns and set those boundaries. There's blessing in, in the boundaries. And when children get older, I'm told sometimes... Sometimes they'll come back and say, thank you. Thanks for not letting me do that dumb thing that I wanted to do. And even if they don't, set the boundaries. Proverbs 22, 6 tells us, train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. And so what if you've dropped the ball to this point? What if you had a terrible role model growing up? Well, if you had a terrible role model, you know what not to do. Right? There are some things that you probably wouldn't want to repeat that your parents may have done. Um, look at folks around you. Look at folks who seem to be doing well with this parenting thing. Although be careful because when you approach them, they might tell you that it's a train wreck. But you know what? Parenting is done best, I believe, in honest community with other believers. I know especially when my children were little, it was such a comfort to talk to other parents who were going through similar struggles and to know that we weren't the only ones that were totally messing this up, right? And so work in honest community with other people. Maybe if you know some parents that are a little bit further down the road, talk to them, pick their brains, find out what it is that they're doing, but look for folks that seem to be raising their kids up in the nurture and instruction of the Lord. And so as we close uh, from this message, you might be thinking, well, well, well what, what do I do with this? What am I supposed to do? I want to make sure when we close that we're super clear. When you walk out of this room, what do I do? Well, honor your parents, even if it's hard. And be a parent worth honoring. And why should I do that? You might be thinking, well, I want to make sure that you know why. To talk about why, I want you to imagine for me, let's dream together, if you would, what it would look like if you and your family and in your home did this. What if you honored your parents? And what if your children honored you the way that they saw you honor their parents? How might that change things in your home? What might look different in your family? And then I want you to imagine for a minute if everyone in this room and all of us that are watching online began to do this, and our homes began to look different, and our church began to look different, and the community outside began to see that it looks different. What's going on there? 
There's a, there's a culture of honor in that place. Ultimately, what they would see is us loving God with all of our heart, soul, and mind. What they would see is a group of people that don't just say they believe in something. They would see a group of people that are following Jesus. And that's the goal. Because, listen, Jesus is an example worth following. As we close, I want, you to, I want to invite you to, to take that cup that you were given and just kind of peel off that top, that top layer there. Hopefully it's easy for, easier for you than it is for me up here. You at home, if, hopefully you've gathered some crackers and juice or, and you're ready. But, uh, and I want to remind you, you don't need to be a member of First Alliance Church to partake in this, but this is something that Jesus um, invited his followers to do in an act of remembrance. And in Matthew 26, we read about Jesus on the night before his crucifixion. He had asked his disciples to, uh, to come and, and pray with him. And in Matthew 26, verse 38, it says, Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell to his face to the ground and he prayed, my father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Even in his distress, when his soul was overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, Jesus saw fit to honor his father. In so doing, he made a way for us, a way for us to be reconciled to the father and in one last act of his earthly ministry, he models for us what it looks like to honor a father. And just prior to this, he had shared a meal to his disciple or with his disciples. And on the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Would you eat together with me? In the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this is the cup, the new covenant in my blood. And do this. And whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's drink together. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, what a, what a beautiful act of submission, of honor, not only did you honor your father, but you made a way. You made a way for us. Even though we don't get it right, even though sometimes we, we try too hard, sometimes we don't. But you're a God that's concerned with our heart, with our mind, and that you've came and fulfilled the law because you love us. An amazing God you are. Thank you. As we keep our eyes closed for just a moment, I want to acknowledge that maybe you're here this morning and maybe you're not so sure about all this. Maybe some of this is new to you. Maybe, uh, maybe you're not real familiar with this whole communion thing. Or, but maybe you realize that Jesus loves you today. Maybe you've come to a place where you see that he does want the very best for you. That if you're his blessing within boundaries, and maybe today's the day when you decide, you know what? I've been on my own long enough. Maybe it's time to give it all to him. Maybe it's time to lay it at his feet and let him do what only he can. If that's you, I'd love to pray for you this morning. I would invite you to just raise your hand. If there's anybody in this room, maybe you've, you don't know Jesus, but you just slip your hand up. I don't want to, good, I see you. Thank you. Anybody else? Awesome, I see you. Thank you. I'm going to 
to give just another moment. I don't want to let this opportunity to go by for anybody. Father, thank you. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for these that raise their hand. Lord Jesus, may we have conversation today that can help point them even further toward you. Lord, I pray that no one would leave here today without knowing you as their Savior, as their Lord, God, without allowing you to transform their lives. We just thank you so much. We ask it in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Yeah, as you leave, before you leave today, first I want to invite you, if you made that decision or if you online made that decision, uh, there was a button there that you could click. If you made that decision, I would invite you to text new to Jesus at the number 94,000. I would just invite you to send a text to that. We want to we wanna reach out to you and, and, uh, and make sure that you don't miss any opportunities there. And then I would also say before any of you walk out, you might notice this slick red bag here. Uh, if you notice out in the breezeway, the prime timers there, they've been putting together these bags and these are bags full of goodies that you can give to somebody as you're out and about in the community. You see somebody that looks like they are, have fallen on hard times. Maybe they don't have a place to lay their head at night or a place to take a shower. Maybe they look a little hungry. There are some great things in here for them. There's some water. There's some snacks in here. There's a fresh pair of socks in here. But if you see somebody that looks like they could use a little love, stop and hand this to them. And listen, when you hand it to them, don't just, don't just toss it out the window. Stop and have a conversation. Let them, know, let them know about what extravagant generosity looks like. Let them know that these are available because there are God's people that love them and that Jesus loves them, uses that as an opportunity to have a gospel conversation with those folks, okay? So, so I want to invite you, don't, on your way out, you can pick these up, grab as many as you think you can use, okay? Um, so thanks, guys. Thanks for coming. We love you. I'm glad that you made it today. Have a great day.